Hebrews chapter 10, verse 35. I am going to speak. This applies to everybody. The title of my message is Outlast Everything. Outlast Everything. How many know that everything has been thrown against us? Everything but the kitchen sink, and I think that's probably coming too, right, has been thrown at us. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 35. So do not throw away your confidence. It will be richly rewarded. There it is right there. You need to persevere so that when you have done the will of God, you will receive what he has promised. For just a little while he who is coming will and will not delay, and but by my righteousness one will live by faith. And I take no pleasure in the one who shrinks back. But we do not belong to those who shrink back and are destroyed, but to those who have faith and are saved. My grandpa used to always tell me, if you hang around long enough, son, something good's going to happen to you. And there are times in your life where you don't have the will and the courage to fight for a year. You don't have the will and courage to fight for a month. You don't have a, a week left in you. You just maybe have a series of 24-hour days to say, God, I give you one more. And if that's all you have, you have a lot to give God. The Bible says a smoking flack he shall not quench, which means that as long as there's a little bit of smoke left on that stick, there's still an opportunity for a mighty fire to begin to ignite. So never underestimate the power of one more day, of one more step of courage, and rising above one more circumstance. I went to youth camp when I was a teenager. I grew up as a stuttering kid in a mega church. That is not a good formula. My father is pastor of a mega church one of the largest in the country, and I was a teenage kid who could barely finish a sentence and communicate clearly. So when I went to youth camp and I was praying in the, up in the mountains of Payson, Arizona, and God, for the first time in my life, I felt the presence of God, not from a secondhand revelation through my father's experience, but a firsthand revelation from God. See, you can go to heaven on a secondhand revelation. You can uh, be with Jesus on a secondhand revelation. But you'll never enjoy the journey of life until you receive a firsthand revelation for yourself of who God is. And that's what happened to me at that youth camp. And I prayed all night long and until the next morning sessions were, were starting. And I'm, I'll never forget that experience of, of seeking God. And the last night... I, I got up and I told everybody in the youth camp that I'm going to be a preacher. I'm going to start preaching sermons. And I'm going to pastor a church one day in Los Angeles, California. And uh, everyone kind of laughed or not really laughed, but kind of smiled and golf clapped. You know, oh, yeah, amen. You know, I'm with you. And uh, it was one of those circumstances. But, uh, but I went home and I told my dad. I said, Dad, I'm going to start preaching. I'm going to start. Um, can you help me? He said, yeah, here. He threw me the Assemblies of God directory of every church listed from A to Z. And I called everyone, and I got three churches that invited me to preach. My first sermon, I was so pumped up. I had a 45-minute sermon outline all prepared, and I got to the church, and, and I, I was so nervous, I preached my whole sermon in five minutes. <laughs> Some of you wish I would get more nervous, you know, and uh, do that again. But uh, when I was done, I went to the front row, and I sat there, and I was so embarrassed because I just, like, stuttered and, like, like preaching 3,000 miles an hour in my sermon, and... And uh, this man came up to me at the end of service, his old usher, dignified man, put his hand on my shoulder. He said, son, I want to tell you something. I said, what's that, sir? He looked like he had the, the look of heaven on him. I said, what's your advice? He said, don't do it. Don't preach the gospel. Some people have it and some people don't. God has something else in your life. Amen. The brother had the spirit of encouragement, right? And, uh, and I know I needed some work, so I called my grandma. I said, Grandma, could you help me book churches? She said, yes, I can. You'll be booked next week. I said, really? My dad couldn't even do that. How are you able to do it? She said, well, I'm the pastor. I'm the counselor of all the pastors in the city of Kansas City. They all come to me for counseling. I know every one of their secrets. They will definitely have you come and preach. So under the manipulation, I mean the anointing of my grandma, I was booked to go preach, and I was done one night preaching, and it was the worst sermon I've ever preached. It was, it was, it was so bad, maybe even heaven was turning away. I don't know. But uh, when, when, I, when I was done, my grandma came up to me, and, uh, and uh, she was going to take me home. I said, well, I, I need to, like, I, I need to go talk to the pastors. And so I went to the back room to talk to the pastors. I overheard them talking, and, 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 and I heard them say things I'll never forget. They said, you know, we knew his grandfather and his father, and how awesome they were, but it's sad to hear a young man do something he's really not called to do. 
And I heard that, but I didn't want to walk in and embarrass him. And, and I just decided to walk home instead. And I, I walked through the night in Kansas City several miles. And, uh, and I just cried. I just left everyone. And nobody knew where I went. I just vanished from the church. Grandma didn't know where I was. I just walked home. And then she finally got home. She said, what are you doing? I said, I just walked home. She said, why? I said, because I overheard those pre preachers. And they were talking in the back. And they said that, that uh, I'll never be a preacher. And I'll never be able to do it. And I couldn't preach. And, and I just cried. And my grandma looked at me. She said, I don't know what they're talking about. She said, that was the greatest sermon, honestly, I've ever heard in my entire life. Thank the Lord for lying grandmas all over the country. Amen. Just somehow heaven looks down and says, I got you. You're fine. And, um, and I know I needed somewhere. I just began to preach to the trees. And I went outside, and there's a little Christian church in a tree stump. And I practiced preaching every day. And I would look at those trees, and I would say, today, we're going to live for God. You trees that are intertwined over there, wait till you're married before you do that. You know, and I preached to the, the wind would blow, and I said, the wind of the Holy Spirit is here. I can just feel it. Can you see it? And, and they would drop like little acorns. I'd be like, thank you for that offering right there. We receive that by faith. It's going to go to great work of the missions ministry. And I'm like doing offerings, preaching to the trees. And uh, yeah, yeah, it's, maybe I lost it. I don't know. But I'm out there. And every day I'm out there, there's a, a janitor from the little Christian church. He would go, good job. Like he would just kind of encourage me and go back in and one day as I was preaching the trees, he walked down to the front. He said, you know, I've been listening to you preach. And he said, do you think God still loves me? And he said, I've been struggling with alcohol and I can't get free. And Do you think God will save me? And right there in the tree stump, I led that man to Jesus Christ. And the first person to get saved in the preaching ministry. <laughs> Almost kind of felt by accident, you know, and, so, and humanly speaking. But spiritually, God was, was speaking to this man. And I began to realize, you just got to get back up. There's going to be things in your life that will try to stop you from making it to the end. Every single person in the Bible, every New Testament um, apostle, every one of them had one goal in mind. And that was not to build the biggest church. They never really talked too much about uh, numerical growth. They didn't talk about goals or any really anything. The disciples, all they really talked about, once they got a revelation of what Jesus had done for them, all they wanted to do was to be faithful. All they wanted to do is at the end of their life, it was said that they fought the good fight, and then they finished the course, and the greatest dream of all is to one day say, I have kept the faith. That was her goal. That's, that, that's the whole revelation because, you know, success and all these things is elusive. And, uh, and you, you can't predict pandemics. You can't predict all these times. And uh, as good as we plan and strategize what we want to accomplish, plans can fall apart. But the cause of Christ and the purpose of God, when you decide it's in your heart forever and you say, what, no, whatever comes my way, I am going to outlast and go forward. And just keep going forward. I'm telling you today, there's a wonderful goal of just being faithful that just everything else take care, takes care of itself. So many pastors that, would, that come and speak for our church, they're not like you guys who are really still really kind of flourishing. But most churches are down like 40%. They're going through um, a lot of really tough times. And I just tell the pastors, I said, look, I mean, you should just make the goal right now of being faithful. He said, our crowds are down. I said, well, let me give you advice. Don't even look out at the crowd to the fourth song. Because eventually they'll get there. When the saints come dragging in, they'll get there eventually, right? <laughs> and you just keep a good spirit. You keep a good spirit. My dad told me years ago that everything goes wrong in a church service and every song falls apart. Not this church, but uh, other churches. Every song here is like perfect all the time. But, uh, but if something goes wrong, he said, if you have a good spirit, you can always win back a service if you have a good spirit. And my dad said, you got to outlast negativity, bitterness, discouragement. You just keep standing in a good spirit. The Bible said of David, he served his generation by the will of God. Now, we, didn't know he, we know he didn't always do that. But that was said of David. He served his generation by the will of God. And this is the same guy who committed adultery and murder and, and uh, set the framing of a good man of his murder. I mean, if you look at David's life, it's amazing moments of courage also mixed with cowardice. Yet it was said this man served his generation. Why? Because he outlasted his failures. He outlasted the knockout punch that could have put his life forever on hold. He got back up again. He sought God. He began to understand that his relationship was the most important thing with God and that he didn't need success back. He wanted, he wanted to have a relationship with God back. 
We have people come into our program every day. I mean, the other day in our rehab program, we have 220 men and women in our drug and alcohol rehab program for one year. Everything that we do is one year because we realize it takes time for people to get through the layers and the issues of their life. And I asked some men and women in rehab, I said, how many of you taken fentanyl recently? Just hands are going up everywhere. I mean, just like, it's just sweeping through our community under the bridges everywhere. And the first thing that we tell those guys when they come into the program is, what is your dream? And it freaks them out because they've been living in survival mode their whole life. Just trying to get by, just trying to get through one more day. But we ask them, what is their dream? And the reason why is because we're giving, trying to give them something big to live for that will carry them through their life. What is your dream? And, and I see them coming in every day and, and, uh, and just lining up and filling out their application. And sometimes their parents bring them in and they tell them it's a 30-day program just to get them through the doors. The parents are lying to them just because they're so desperate to help their kids. And then we tell them it's a year. And you should see the look on their face then. But, uh, but faithfulness, you know, and everybody loses things, they want things back. And, that, and that's what we teach them the first thing is don't, if you've lost things, don't worry about what you lost. Never fight for the things that you lost that you want back. Get God back. If you have God back, everything comes back. Don't try to get back what you lost. Get God back in your life. Because when you have God back in your life, you have everything back. Years ago, I heard my dad preach a sermon called Why It's Hard to Come Back. And he talked about the reason why it's hard to come back is because many times we fail. We want the wrong things back. We want power and influence. We want all the things that we lost back. And he talks to pastors who have fallen who want to make a comeback. He said, don't try to get back the things you've lost. He said, forget about that. Get God back in your life. Then you have everything back. But as I look at our lives, I look at the battles and the tests and, uh, and the struggles. And, you know, when the pandemic hit, people wrote off the Dream Center. It was over for us. We only had like a month of money in reserves to operate that building. It's $12 million a year, a million dollars a month, 700 plus residents, three meals a day, um, free of charge, everything. And when that pandemic hit, everything wiped out. Our youth groups, short-term missions, which is half a million dollars a year in revenue, that was wiped out. Nobody was traveling, um, speaking on the road, that was gone. My dad and I both, we were like, we were impacted $2 million right up on top. And I, I was driving down the road and I, and I heard um, our mayor talk about the restrictions. We we're the first ones to go into lockdown. And God spoke to me. He said, I want you to go back to where it all started. Because when I was 20 years of age, a ministry started with a little desk on the sidewalk and, my, and my, my phone right there and three bags of food. God said, go right back to the beginning. Go to your food pantry. And just in 72 hours, I want you to start feeding people. And so we sat there, and I was listening. They're saying, all these essential workers are going back. And I'm looking at all this. And I'm like, okay, essential workers, what does that mean? And I said, well, you know, we've given $1.5 billion of economic aid. We've pretty much emptied the prisons. 40 prisoners a month have been sentenced to the Dream Centers, $81,000 a year to incarcerate somebody, $6,000 a year for us to rehabilitate somebody, times 20-something years. I think we're essential, right? <laughs> and so I, I knighted myself. You are officially essential, you know. And, uh, and we went down there, and, like, nobody was on the freeway. We just said, anyone needs food. I, I, something unbelievable began to happen. People began to, like, send Twitter messages out. Celebrities were sending them out. People I didn't even know. Like, I, I go look at my phone, and we have, like, uh, people, like, uh, I have no idea how they heard about it. Just people were talking about it everywhere. And uh, they're saying, if you need food, go to the Dream Center. And a lot of people were excited about what we were doing. I mean, they, they were nervous about getting out of the house, but they were excited that somebody was out there kind of throwing rocks at giants, you know. And, uh, and then I get it, and Bella Hadid, the model, is like, go to the Dream Center. I'm like, I've never even met you. I have no idea who you are, you know. And so all these models started, like, sending messages. And, uh, and all my single guys, I'm like, calm down, guys. And, uh, but, <laughs> but it just got wild. People coming by serve, and, and the line just kept going night and night after night. And uh, all this started happening. And, and, then, and then God just spoke to me. He said, if you feel that you are done, because you're saying that you're done, if you're saying you can't make it another month, might as well go out and do the biggest thing you've ever done in your life on your way out the door. Sometimes God will actually meet you at the point of your rationale, but then later he'll take you, you know, later to a greater faith, you know, and he kind of met me right there. 
And we just start going forward, and then the windows of heaven start opening up, and blessings came and made up the difference from ways we could not. You just got to keep fighting. You just got to get up one more day. You, great faith is not always, oh, bless God, everything is going to be perfect. Sometimes it's moving forward, and you got a lot of fear, but you just keep moving because ultimately, in the midst of all your battles and struggles and, and doubts, and your, you have them, but what keeps you, your feet moving is deep down inside, you still have more belief, even though you don't always feel it or say it, that God is going to do something in your life. It's okay to want to quit. Wanting to quit is a sign of success because it means that you have something to quit. Only successful people have the desire to want to quit. So if you want to quit today, congratulations. You join people like Jeremiah, who actually did quit for a couple days, and he said, I'm done. I'm going up to the mountains to retire. Nobody's hearing my sermon. But then he had a little issue in his life. He said, I got this fire shut up in my bones that every time I try to quit, I got to go back down and I got to be faithful and preach the word. Sometimes your faith will still keep moving forward even though you don't feel it. Because ultimately something in you, you've been to this church long enough, you've heard enough amazing heroic sermons from your pastor that even though you feel like, man, I don't have the faith to go forward, you still find yourself going forward. Because there's something in you on the inside. What is the ultimate reward of life? What's the greatest title? President of the United States or Super Bowl champion, Nobel Peace Prize winner, Heisman Trophy winner, World Series champion, Fortnite champion? That might be the best one of all. I don't know, but all I know is that the greatest title of them all is always going to be a servant. I, I, we would tell people all the time that the greater success that God gives you don't, don't get cocky or arrogant because that just means that you have to go lower to serve more people. The weapons of our warfare, of our warfare are not carnal. Notice weapons. They're going to have to fight. And that's why God gave us a helmet of salvation, the breastplate of righteousness, and, and the feet that are shod, the gospel, the preparation of peace, all these things. But God never gave us anything on our backside when it comes to warfare. Why? Because he never intended for us to show our back to the enemy. He gave us the warfare of our weapons so that we advance and we go forward. You outlast your, outlast, there's someone here, outlast your greatest mistake. Outlast that one thing in the middle of the night. You go to sleep and you're still haunted by, why did I do this? Why did I make this business a shizzle? Why did I, you know, compromise that night? Why did I go to that place? Why did I say those words? You have got to outlast those things by your faith and endurance to keep going forward. Create some new uh, memories that will overshadow the ones of yesterday. Outlast. Outlast. You're going to need spiritual weapons all the time to outlast your enemies. And you got to get a word from God, and you got to hold on to that word. When God called me to L.A., he said, I'm calling you for life to L.A. Now, everyone's call is different. Not everyone's called to be in the same city for the rest of their life. But God, when I was 20, the Lord spoke to me. He said, don't live with overwhelming pressure because you have your whole life. You're going to serve in L.A. And you need to pace yourself and not get discouraged if you have one bad week. There's something beautiful about giving yourself... Uh, to God forever, because you have time to figure it out, right? Say, like, oh, I missed my five-year goals. Oh, I got 50 years left. All right, we'll, we'll figure it out. <laughs> Commit yourself to the finish line before you even start your journey. And, and, you know, along the way, just so many setbacks. When we started, we bought this big old hospital building. And I just show up for like five seconds. I don't want to get, because I got something to say. I don't want to get bogged down. But we bought this big old hospital building uh, back in the 1990s and 94. And uh, we had nothing. We had $50,000 in the bank. And there's Dodger Stadium on top of the hill. That's the Dream Center Hospital. And, uh, yeah. And so that's all we had. Like 50000 Our whole church was homeless. 35 out of 40 members were homeless um, at that time, and we're like saying, we we're, we're going to buy this building. Um, Paramount was going to buy it. Uh, motion pictures, all the scenes in Halloween um, were filmed in our building. I literally had to go to my first day of, of office, and Mike Myers was in the elevator with me <laughs> filming a scene because they, when we bought the building, they were still finishing Halloween. We had to pray every demon out of that building. <laughs> I mean, we, we have Freddy Krueger boiler room uh, places in our building, so I sent others to go pray there, you know. Just go ahead. It's, it's you. The Lord's called you there. You know, I'm not going down there, but. I mean, we have all kinds of, we've been praying every demon out of that building. You can find. 
But when we got there, it was, it was, it was interesting because the Catholic Church sold it to us for 39 And instead of selling it to Paramount for $16 million and the sweetest sisters that we talked to and just a beautiful thing. But it was still reckless. I mean, $3.9 million in 18 months or you lose your current building. We were getting emails and um, they were criticizing my father and I. There were even Christian articles um, talking about like faith. Is it responsible faith or is it God faith? You know, and like, or you know, all this stuff, the difference between being a responsible believer, a responsible risk taker versus being a reckless one. We're pretty much the reckless one, right? And my dad and I sat down at a restaurant. We were looking at this napkin and all the reasons why we should buy it and shouldn't. And uh, so we look at it and we're like, uh, you know, pros and cons of buying this building. And uh, pros, you know, and then the cons are it's $4 million and we have $50,000 a year in the bank. It's a pretty big one, right? Cons are the upkeep is going to be extraordinary. The cons are all of our staff are ex-cons, you know, and just all there. <laughs> Two pages, <laughs> four napkins. And then we went to the pros. We're like, the pros, um, what if? That's all we had. What if God built a city within a city of 24 hours a day where nobody got turned away? What if there was a place where if somebody had a drug addiction, somebody would take him in in the middle of the night? What if instead of someone going to prison, they could be sentenced to the house of God? What if... The girl getting off the train station in the middle of the night can be met not by the pimps but by the church and be brought in. What if? Your pros and cons don't always have to line up in order for it to be faith. In fact, they never really will. What if we bought a building in a pandemic in 2020 in Oak Cliff and just begin to serve people in parking lots while we're waiting for the building to be done? What if? What if is powerful? But it's also scary because there will be a lot of people that are smarter than you that will actually tell you that what you're doing is not right. And I'm reading their email saying a father and son, you know, and um, risking everything, reckless faith. And I'm reading and I'm agreeing with every one of my haters. I'm not even mad at them. <laughs> Have you ever, like, actually agree with your haters? You're like, yeah, you're right, man. Or someone sends you a message on Instagram, you're not even mad. You're just like, yeah, I think you're right. But, uh. I don't know if we can do that or not, but my feet keep going forward. I don't know why, but uh, I wasn't mad at him. But I, one thing I realized is I know what God called us to do. I, know, I knew that God, when he put me on that rooftop, he said, I'm going to build a 24-hour church, and we're not going to turn away people, and we're just going to just outlast people in the neighborhood. I knew God spoke that. So there's kind of a certain kind of soundtrack of heaven where God was speaking to me, and he speaks to me with different soundtracks. And, uh, and I began to hear, like, God is going to, yes, yes, God, we, we could do this. It was like that old headphones commercial. Remember when uh, Kaepernick and then different actors and, uh, and, and just different people People in general and athletes from all over the world, you know, they would get like people yelling and then they put the headphones on and then everything got quiet. And so they had that, those Beats commercials, they put the headphones on, everyone got, everything just began to get quiet. And so I saw that. I said, God, God, that's well. I, I want to have that mindset when it comes to calling. Someone doubts you, smile and just say, praise the Lord, but just hear what God calls you to do. And just be, and so, and so, man, there's times in your life where people say you can't do it. On the surface, they might be right. In the flesh, they might be right. But we've never been called to live a life by the flesh. We're called to live by the Spirit. So I came here at 20 years of age, buying a hospital at 22. People said it can't be done. So I put my headphones on. Wait, wait a second, wait a second, wait, wait. You're buying a building at $50,000 and it costs $4 million? Yeah, I know, right? Wait, wait, wait a second, wait a second. You're from Phoenix, Arizona. No good thing comes out of Phoenix, Arizona. You can't pastor a church in L.A. You don't understand everything that goes on in L.A. I know, but... Hey, hey, well, hey okay, okay. You're really going to go to Oak Cliff in, in the middle of a pandemic? You're really going to try... Are you serious? Nobody does that. This is time to tuck and run. Hide your money. Put it all in Bitcoin somewhere. I don't know. Just hide it. This is not time to go to the moon. But you guys are talking about going to the moon and building a great church and doing something big in the neighborhood. What do you guys think you're doing? I know, but I think it's exciting. We're going to go for it. We're going to get a building in Oak Cliff and build something great for God. Why? You can't do it. Your whole life. It's going to be that. 
But you've got to listen to the beat of the calling. You've got to listen to the soundtrack of heaven that says, just keep on moving forward. Just keep on trusting. Just keep on believing. Put on the soundtrack and spend the rest of your life dancing. We need some spiritual warfare to outlast our enemies. I can never do this illustration in any other church but this one. This is the first one I've done it on Sunday morning. I did this in Tulsa, and they're like, what's that? <laughs> Here it's like, oh, man, you got the edited version. No, I'm just teasing. But uh, <laughs> the weapons of our warfare and our carnal weapons, we're going to have to have weapons. We're going to have to fight many battles in our life, many things that will try to stop your calling, that will stand in your way. But you don't fight adversaries. You just keep smiling and standing and working and going forward because the truth is the people that doubt your calling aren't necessarily bad people. They're just people that don't know what God's put in your heart, and they never will. They were never supposed to. There are some stumbling blocks that stop us from wearing that label of faithfulness, but we must outlast the hurricanes of life. And I've seen it so many times during this pandemic. We're out there feeding people and driving by. And people were showing up once to get food. And the second time they would come around and they would say, Pastor, I just came the second time because I just wanted to see that you guys are still there. We just drive by again because we thought maybe you guys would be gone. 30% of the businesses in our neighborhood are gone. About 25% unemployment in our community. And people just literally drive by the Dream Center just to see if we're still there. Wow. Outlasting, standing fighting for one more day one more day you see many times we have a hard time fighting for one more day but we don't understand if we just get up one more day you'll feel different the next day than if you make a rash decision yesterday there's new mercies there's new checkpoints there's new levels and every time you pass a certain checkpoint god has something awaiting for you at that next place and that next place and that next place stay alive long enough to get to the next checkpoint of your calling where god will do something but people get tired. The great ones, Elijah, the prophets of Baal, great victory. And then, and then just from a little attack from Jezebel, he's running from his life and he's just wanting to throw in the towel. That's the way it is in the kingdom of God sometimes. You will win great victories and then you will let petty things get on the inside. But you've got to overcome and get back up quick. And the faster you get back up, the more time you can redeem for the future. And that's why we don't judge people when people come into our recovery program who fail, maybe come back a second time. And I see people come back and, you know, they, they go through rehab eight months and then they fail and they go back and then they come back in the program and I walk on the floor, they kind of try to hide, like they're embarrassed. I run to that person immediately and say, I am so proud of you. You're not a quitter. I mean, you're in here battling again. You got back up. A just person falls seven times, but they rise back up again. They're not just because they're perfect. They're just because they just won't stay down. Amen. The Bible says, he who endures to the end shall be saved. It doesn't say he who makes it to the end and looks like their Easter Sunday photo at church with their nice outfits and hats on. If you look like that, you will be saved. No, he who endures to the end will be saved. You might look like your DMV photo at the end, but those are the ones who are going to be saved, right? Hold firm to the truth. Outlast the greatest victories of your life. Outlast the need to say, I'm settling in because of a great victory of the past. Don't settle into pride. Keep gaining new ground. Outlast everything. And just remain strong because you never know who is being inspired by your courage. More people can identify and that's why I tell pastors all the time, they'll say, how's your giving going? A lot of times pastors, you know, they don't want to talk about the bad stuff, you know, with other pastors. They'll be like, oh, yeah, we're up 120%. Pastors talk to me, how you doing? We're down 30%. You guys are down too? Sometimes people can't identify with your struggles as much as they can with your victories. Somebody is watching your endurance. And every single funeral I've done in our building, which is a landmark building in Los Angeles, the famous Angelus Temple, and so we have state uh, funerals in there. Of some of the, well, like it's one of the ten places to visit. Amy Simple McPherson, pastor of the church building that I pastor in. And so it's a legendary building. People want to use it for everything. And every single funeral that I see in that building that talks about great people who did great things, it's always never about their accomplishments. It's always about an attribute that they had. And no one really talks about what they accomplished. It's that person had a lot of peace, or that person was gentle, or that person was courageous. 
What you do in this earth will be forgotten, but who you are will be set in motion for years to come. Outlast and keep a good spirit. I close with this. You never know who's watching. You never know who's out there fighting for you. You don't even know. But during uh, the pandemic last year, we had uh, 20,000 presents that we were going to give away uh, for Christmas. We are going to do it very carefully, you know, the drive through and, and um, everyone had gloves, mask on. Just people come by, drop off gifts in people's trunk. And then we get out of the car. They move on. We give a beautiful light show. They drive through and get a chance to see lights. And we just wanted to be the only um, event in L.A. that really was just having Christmas. I mean, everything shut down. I mean, I mean completely. I, it's very hard to explain, unless you're from California, how different it really, really was. And so people were flying over and looking at uh, Los Angeles, and they would see this one spot where there's so many lights. It looked like Chevy Chase. And every night it was like, we're flying over here, L.A., it's very quiet. And all of a sudden, then they look over and they're like, oh, there's one corner in L.A. where it's lit up like Chevy Chase's house. You know, it's just everybody's commenting on it. And, and uh, that's why I, love, I just love to be different. But uh, um, And so... We were just out there, and so we were going to create the greatest light experience. And so we were ready to go. Two days before, we get a phone call from the, go, from the health department saying, you guys are going to have to shut down the event. I said, yeah, but, you know, it's like, it's, it's, it's just people driving up in cars, dropping them off. And, you know, we have one guy who's giving away $50,000 of cash randomly to cars. And uh, just, it's going to be awesome. No, yeah, but we're going to have to shut down. I said, okay, I understand. But I'm going to have to go on social media and tell all of our people that you guys are shutting it down, not us, because I don't want kids mad at me in the neighborhood for like the next five years. So I'm going to have to tell them, you're totally fine. We understand. Just let them know that we're shutting the event down and we'll, we'll take the blame. I said, good. And uh, so I got on there and, I, and basically I said, you know, sorry guys, because the health department, we can't have the event this year. Um, we were very excited about it and I didn't realize it. They didn't realize it. It got like a million views. It just took off all over the country. People were like, uh, the L.A. is canceling Christmas, you know. And uh, it was so, I like, I'm like, I did not expect you to get that big, nor that was my intention, you know. And uh, I was just trying to get the neighborhood off the hook and it turns into a phenomenon, right. And uh, all this is going on. And, uh, and so we get a phone call one day from this guy who um, heard, of, he saw the Dream Center from like a Jason Kennedy from E! News was, was doing push-ups to support the Dream Center. And he heard about it or something and like he got all excited and he called me out of the blue one day this guy I've never talked to him in my life he goes he goes I answered the phone I said hello and he said you're my pastor I'm like who are you and he began to explain who he was he's one of the most influential men on this planet I mean he's done everything and he he let me know he's done everything right one of the biggest supporter of like every I mean every democratic candidate you can possibly find like he's given more money I mean he is like the biggest and I don't even know this guy. He just called me as pastor because he liked what I said or what somebody said about the dreams that are doing push-ups. It was really random. So he just called me out of the blue. Like, okay, I guess I'm your pastor. You know, I'm just talking to him. And, uh, and he called me and said, hey, I saw that video. He goes, I'm best friends with Gavin Newsom. I've given more to his money. I've done more for supporters. He goes, I'm going to call him. And, and, and I said, great, okay. And so he called him on the phone. And, uh, and boy, he laid into him. And then... He said, you can't stop this. This is the Dream Center. These guys have been here for 27 years. We can't drive out good people. Well, he went on and on and on. And then uh, Newsom texted him back and said, I will pound L.A. County, make sure this doesn't happen. A few hours later, I get a phone call from the health department. And they're like, this is Dream Center? I said, yeah. Oh, man, we love you guys. Great vision. Whatever you need going forward in the future, we're just here for you. We just love you. You're wonderful people. And they're just like... Well, cool, you know, and, uh, and I just realized you just never know. You never know if you keep going who's fighting for you. You never know the people out there that uh, God will use on your behalf to fight for people in the community. And I, I just sat back and I laughed. I said, you just keep going. You don't know what miracles are in store for you. You don't know what opportunities are in store for you. But you got to keep going. Outlast everything. Build the reputation of somebody who just won't quit.